Welcome. My name is Patty Laughlin, and I'm with Sarah Janda. And we are excited to be part of the public programming sponsored by uh, the Cherokee Strip Regional Heritage Center and Jake Crumwitty, as well as Elizabeth Bass and Kathy Dixon at the Oklahoma Historical Society and Oklahoma Humanities. We've been working on a project for a long time now. A couple of years, yes. Called This Land is Her Land, Gendered Activism in Oklahoma from the 1870s to the 2010s. Yes. And maybe you'd like to tell us a little bit about it. Sure. So this is a project that has been in the making because there hasn't been enough attention to women's activism in Oklahoma. And so we took this opportunity to work with our friends and colleagues who also study the history of women in Oklahoma. And we've put together 13 biographical chapters that really look at, at how women have engaged in activism in Oklahoma. And as we talk about the three sections, it's probably helpful to define what we mean by activism. It's women who have tried to affect change in the circumstances and society in which they found themselves. And so our people that we are talking about and the three panels that you will see range. They range in political beliefs. They range in perceptions of suffrage. They range in ethnicity and race and all kinds of ways. But we're really interested in talking about how women have chosen to become active and try and shape change around them. And so I think that's one of the things that we, we often want to emphasize. So during this year, as we highlight the 19th Amendment and uh, women's suffrage, we're excited to participate in Oklahoma Women 100 or OK Women 100. And uh, we have a sneak peek through these three uh, panels to take a look at the women's activism that will be featured in the book. So be looking for the book in 2021 with the University of Oklahoma Press as part of the Women in the American West series. Well, and one of the things we're really excited about that you'll see in the first panel discussion is what we call the fluidity of power. Oklahoma has so many unique aspects to it. And it provided a place where women could really engage in, in ways that they couldn't otherwise. So even before women have the right to vote, coming to Oklahoma territory uh, often provided opportunities that women could not have had in other places at the same time in the United States. And so as, as we look at the first panel discussion, uh, one of the things we would encourage you to pay particular attention to is how women in Oklahoma had this ability to take advantage of opportunities in this fluid time as um, Oklahoma goes through the transformation of being Indian territory and combining with Oklahoma territory through statehood, that there are these moments when women are able to exercise power. For example, you'll hear Heather Clemmer talk about Maddie Mallory and this tremendous ability to amass a real estate empire, whether that was her intent or not. Uh, Heather will talk more about. You'll see an interesting take on uh, Kate Bernard. Many Oklahomans know a little bit about Kate Bernard, but she really had the ability to engage politically without even stepping into the issue of women's suffrage initially. She was someone, as Sunu Kadamathara talks about, um, Kate Bernard was someone who was able to conveniently sidestep suffrage for a while to try and just get stuff done. And, and you see with Farina King's discussion that Rachel Caroline Eaton was someone who was able to use educational opportunities to really affect change for her tribe and take advantage of these things that women couldn't have done in other periods of time. So I think that that's one of the interesting things we see. Hi, I'm Sydney Janda and I'm a 10th grade student at Norman High. And I am here to talk to you about why women's activism in Oklahoma matters to high school students. I am 
the daughter of two history professors. So I've had my fair share of exposure to all sorts of historical facts and ideas. But not everyone has that opportunity, of course. And so what I've realized throughout my education in Oklahoma is that women's activism in Oklahoma is not a very widely talked talked about topic. And what I mean by that is that if we look through our textbooks in Oklahoma history and all sorts of history, I have been, you know, I've gone through in my years of schooling, not many of these women are not talked about that we that are talked about in in uh in her land. And so what I mean by that is Ada Lola Sipiel Fisher is not a huge topic in Oklahoma history currently right now. It is not she was not someone we heard about a lot. Nor nor many of these women in terms of LGBTQ activism, in terms of ERA activism. And so I think it's important that we try to shine a light on these women because, you know, to be honest, many high school students could care less about history. They could care less about any event. They could care less. It all happened in the past. Who cares? But something I have noticed is that people my age tend to care more about activism and bringing about radical change. And so I think it is especially important for girls my age and even guys my age to learn about what women in Oklahoma did, not just women nationally, but women in Oklahoma in terms of the efforts that they made to bring about change in all sorts of different ways. And I think it is important for all of us to learn more about that because it makes, it gives people kind of hope and see, okay, look, we've come a long way, but there's still, of course, a way to go. And so I think that it is very important for especially young people to see that and to see in their home state women who are, who are similar to, to them in a way, to see them coming from nothing and rising up and making a huge contribution to Oklahoma. And that is why I think that uh, women's activism in Oklahoma is crucial to the education of all high school students, uh, not just in Oklahoma. Thank you. My name is Jake Crumweedy, and I am the director at the Cherokee Strip Regional Heritage Center in Enid, Oklahoma. And I want to thank you all for joining us in this difficult time. Taking part in anything right now can be difficult at best, so we thank you for taking part in this important presentation as we explore together women's activism in Oklahoma between 1870 and 2010. Now I want to thank the Oklahoma Humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities, whose financial support makes this program possible. Also, I am grateful for the collaboration of partners at the Museum of the Western Prairie, of the Cherokee Strip Regional Heritage Center, the Oklahoma History Center, and the Oklahoma Historical Society as a whole. I am very excited and pleased to present this series of panel discussions to you. This program is part of a larger project, the uh, This Land is Her Land, Gendered Activism in Oklahoma, 1870s uh, to 2010, which is a volume of works edited by Sarah Epler Janda and uh, Patricia Laughlin with the anticipated publication uh, in the fall of 2021 from the University of Oklahoma Press. The views and opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily reflect the official policy of the Oklahoma Humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities, or the Oklahoma Historical Society. This first program, based on the research of the panelists, is on the topic of fluidity of power. Our panelists are Heather Klemmer, Farina King, and Sunu Kodanthara. Heather Klemmer earned her PhD in history from the University of Oklahoma with a dissertation entitled, The City That Knows How, San Francisco, the Great War, and Urban Identity. She has been teaching full-time in the history, uh, politics, and law department at Southern Nazarene University since 2006, and began serving as the department chair in 2008. In uh, 2011, she became SNU's general education director. Heather just completed nine years on the Oklahoma Historic Preservation Commission as historian and citizen member. Farina King is a member of the Navajo Nation and is the assistant professor of history and affiliated faculty of Cherokee and Indigenous Studies at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah. She received her PhD from Arizona State University in US history. King specializes in 20th century Native American studies, 
She is the author of the Earth Memory Compass, DNA Landscapes and Education in the 20th Century. Sunu Kodamthara is an associate professor of history at Southwestern Oklahoma State University, where she has taught since January of 2010. She graduated with her PhD in American history from the University of Oklahoma in 2011 and is currently editing her manuscript, Anti-Suffragist and the Dilemma of the American West. Sunu currently teaches courses ranging from American history to 1877 and the history of Oklahoma to the 20th century America and women in American history. She has served on the boards of the Western Association of Women's Historians, as well as coordinating uh, Council of Women Historians. In addition, her teaching, uh, in addition to her teaching load, Sunu has served as a board member for the Oklahoma Humanities Council since 2017. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for This Land is Her Land as we explore gendered activism in Oklahoma. Hello, my name is Dr. Heather Clemmer, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about a woman you might not have heard of named Maddie Mallory. Miranda Maddie Mallory was born on March 12, 1865 in Franklin County, Kansas. Miranda's father, John, was born in Connecticut in February 1828, and as a young adult, migrated with his parents to Wisconsin before setting out on his own, purchasing 160 acres in Franklin County in the late 1850s. Miranda's mother, Cassandra, was born in North Carolina in 1846 and moved as a child to Franklin County, Kansas. She married John, 18 years her senior, in April of 1864. Miranda received a public school education and then attended Baker University, a Methodist institution less than 10 miles from the Mallory homestead. Upon her graduation in 1889, she completed another year of educational training in Emporia, Kansas, and then taught for two years in Ottawa, Kansas. In September 1893, Maddie accepted a teaching position at the Dawes Academy in Berwyn, Indian Territory. Established by the Baptist Home Missionary Society, Dawes Academy served the orphans of former Chickasaw slaves. At the Dawes Academy, Maddie met Fanny Johnston and Laura Shaw. The three women began publishing a newspaper they called The Guide. While the whereabouts of the 44 editions of the paper printed in Berwyn are currently unknown, the content of later issues suggests that Maddie and her friends printed religious tracts from men and women who were part of the holiness movement. This holiness movement drew on John Wesley's concepts of purification, love and compassion for those in need, and rejection of social norms that caused people to sin. Maddie spent the summer of 1898 at the Mitzpah Mission in Winnipeg, Canada. The Mitzpah Mission influenced Maddie's future approach to orphans and their worth to the community. At Mitzpah, they provided a boarding school for the quote, care, training, education, and salvation, end quote, of the community's children. The goal was not simply to keep children out of trouble, but to prepare them to serve the community by spreading the gospel. When Maddie returned to Indian Territory in September 80, 1898, she did not return to the Dawes Academy. Instead, she joined a couple in Oklahoma City who had recently opened an orphanage and boarding house for the children of missionary parents. Their home on Reno Street sat in the epicenter of this growing town and they wanted to expand educational opportunities. Maddie saw this as a chance to replicate the mitzvah model in Oklahoma City. Laura Shaw and Fanny Johnston quickly joined Maddie in Oklahoma City and brought the printing press with them. On October 6, 1898, they resumed publication of the guide. The women described the guide as a, quote, weakliness holiness journal for the teaching of a full gospel as laid down in the scriptures, end quote. Each week, Maddie promoted what she considered sound biblical doctrine infused with personal testimonies, sermons, and spiritual advice. Throughout the life of the newspaper, Maddie used the guide as her mouthpiece, engaging in theological conversations about what it meant to be a member of the holiness movement and challenging the societal ills and denominational sins she and others believed degraded their communities. 
at no time during the publication of the guide were women relegated to a ladies page within the newspaper. Women were pastors, biblical scholars in Maddie's mind, and they were part of her publication as well as her work in serving the community. According to several later accounts in the guide, Maddie felt called by God to open a refuge for orphans, homeless, and friendless children. In December of 1898, she urged her guide readers to pray that God would, quote, speedily provide the means for a home, a building, separate from our other building, where we may care for all whom God will send us. Soon after this request, the guide ceased publication for 10 weeks. When the paper resumed, Maddie explained that on January 7, 1899, she and her friends had left the Hershey home with all of their belongings, quote, 16 children, five cents in money, two postage stamps, faith in God, and a divine conviction that God was leading, end quote. Before nightfall, they had secured a rental house on Fifth Street, and the next day, friends began donating items for their new home. Less than a month later, this new family moved again to a large brick building at the corner of Walker and Pottawatomie Street, where they remained for the next ten, two years. Once in the new home, Maddie, Laura, and Fanny filed paperwork to incorporate the Oklahoma Orphanage as a domestic for-profit business corporation in Oklahoma Territory. Thereafter, Maddie referred to herself as president or superintendent of the Oklahoma Orphanage. With a more settled home for the orphans and her staff, Maddie began traveling more as a holiness preacher and activist for orphans. In the summer of 1899, Maddie preached in Fort Worth, Texas, the community of Lamont in Oklahoma Territory, and at a camp meeting in Moonlight, Kansas. Meanwhile, the orphanage continued to grow, requiring more staff and teachers. While she received some support from guide subscribers and friends, she also began to seek aid from Oklahoma City's businessmen and society ladies who began collecting donations. These connections to wealthy, wealthier residents may have helped Maddie get into the booming real estate market. In June 1901, Maddie purchased 15 acres from William and Mamie Guernsey off of Western, just north of 23rd Street. The mortgage book listed Mamie Guernsey as the holder of Maddie's $500 mortgage. To build a home on the land, Maddie sold five of the 15 acres for $375. She also had a friend publish solicitations in the Daily Oklahoman, encouraging urban residents to contribute. With these funds, Maddie paid off the mortgage and completed the orphanage home in less than a year. By the end of 1902, there were 32 children residing at the Oklahoma Orphanage, and Maddie again felt there was not enough space. Maddie's goal of a self-sustaining orphanage required enough land for livestock and crops as well as a home. At the same time, I am Putnam, seeking to take advantage of a new trolley line on Western, offered Maddie $3,000 for the orphanage's 10 acres. In return, Putnam agreed to sell the orphanage 30 acres for $2,000, just three quarters of a mile northwest. This deal, signed in February 1903, provided more land, but also more work. Between her continued itinerant preaching and work on the new property, Maddie decided in August 1903 to end publication of the guide. She believed everyone's focus should be on, quote, bringing in, caring for, and training the orphan children God may give us, end quote. The guide run ended before Maddie's extensive real estate records and land development really began. In April 1905, Maddie paid $12,000 for a quarter section, 160 acres, diagonally across Pennsylvania Avenue and 36th Street from the orphanage. The following March, she sold half of this section to Kate Dunn for $9,000. These transactions paved the way for Maddie to establish a new neighborhood called Beulah Heights. Along with three male associates, they pl platted this neighborhood to include a block for the orphanage, an adjacent block for a school, and 10 acres for a rescue home for unwed mothers. Instead of farmland and livestock, the rest of the addition was prepared for lot divisions 
to be sold to individuals interested in supporting this new community. The money from the sale of individual lots would provide Maddie the revenue to expand the opportunities for orphans. Beulah Heights flourished until 1909 when the Interurban Railway proposed purchasing much of the property to make way for a trolley line to connect El Reno with Oklahoma City. The Interurban offered to sell Maddie property along the new rail line. Maddie purchased 80 acres in Council Grove Township, approximately five miles due west of Beulah Heights. As with Beulah, Maddie had a hand in the plat map development for what became the town of Bethany. It included 40 acres for the Oklahoma Orphanage, 20 acres for a Holiness College, and 20 acres for a new rescue home. Maddie purchased additional land to the west for farmland and livestock, providing the self-sustaining orphanage she always desired. In 1912, at the age of 47, Maddie mar married John Morgan. She continued to serve as president of the orphanage until 1920, when she transferred daily management to the Oklahoma City Welfare League. For the last 18 years of her life, Maddie continued to work at the orphanage, as well as pursuing work in Oklahoma City as a licensed chiropractor. On March 5, 1938, Maddie died of cancer and was buried in Fairlawn Cemetery across Western Avenue from the first property she purchased in Oklahoma City in 1901. In the same cemetery lot, Maddie had buried orphans who died in the early years of her orphanage and their grave markers lay nearby. The Welfare League purchased a modest headstone for Maddie. Besides her name and life dates, the marker included one word, mother. A year after Maddie's death, the Welfare League converted the Oklahoma orphanage into the children's convalescent home moving the orphans to Sunbeam Orphanage to create a place for children suffering from long-term illnesses. In 2014, the home was renamed the Children's Center Rehabilitation Hospital. They continue to consider Maddie as their founder and honored her by erecting a new monument near Maddie's original mar marker in Fairlawn Cemetery. Three lines on the monument are in Maddie's own words, quote, my heart had been burdened for the orphaned and homeless children. God said, go, open the work, and trust me." End quote. Thank you for your time today. CO, hello, as we say in Cherokee. Um, my name is Farina King. I am a Diné historian of Native American history and indigenous studies at Northeastern State University here in Tahlequah. Um, my people are from the southwestern region, Navajo Nation, and I am currently living and working in Cherokee country, uh, Salagi country, here in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And I've had such honor and privilege to study and learn about the rich and intricate history and heritage of our institution, which was originally founded by the Cherokee Nation as the Cher Cherokee Female National Seminary in 1851, after the Trail of Tears, the forced removal of Cherokees, and such a tragic episode in our, our history. And uh, the Cherokees revitalized and continue to uh, support and grow education uh, especially among their people, paying attention not only to the education of their men, but also women. And this led me to the incredible stories of Cherokee alumni from the seminary, known as Cherokee Rosebuds, as they called themselves, like Rachel Caroline Eaton, who was called Callie by her friends and associates. She went to the seminary in, uh, and graduated from there in 1887. The same year that the seminary, the first building um, set in Park Hill, uh, part of this region of Tahlequah, um, where there was this Cherokee renaissance and revitalization of culture and education, there was a major fire that uh, devoured the building. And Rachel Caroline Eaton um, and other seminarians at the time, they were able to escape 
Um, what's incredible from that is she graduated with male seminarians. And that moment is very powerful for me to reflect on because it shows, you know, when there were a lot of binaries and dichotomies being drawn between the roles and, and what kind of boundaries a woman could have uh, at that time in the late 19th century going into the 20th century, um, Callie, she pushed those boundaries. And it's hard to know without hearing her voice directly, her thoughts about this, seeing a journal or such, but to imagine her next to these uh, Cherokee men and graduating with them um, after this fire, it, it's very inspiring of how Cherokee scholars really arise from these ashes and, and difficult circumstances. The resurgence of their um, efforts to stand for their sovereignty to represent Cherokee Nation when you have competing, conflicting sovereignties and senses of nationalism within the, what we call the United States, but these indigenous nations such as Cherokee who persevere because of individuals like Cali who don't give up and who continue to stand and work for their nation that they identify primarily with Cherokee Nation, right? And, and that's a very powerful um, thread of the history that I, I traced in this chapter for the forthcoming volume, This Is Her Land, about Callie, is she's an example. Her, her life and work give a glimpse into um, these wonderful women who were pushing boundaries, trailblazers of their time, and they did it often as loyal country women of the Cherokee Nation when that Cherokee Nation was being challenged, their existence as a nation, and these, um, quote, multiple sovereignties were being challenged by a hegemonic force you know, of the United States and American nationalism. And various scholars have contributed to these kind of analyses and this work to understand lives and contributions of women such as Cali, specifically these Cherokee seminarians and scholars, uh, Devin Mihisua, Kirby Brown, um, and even legacies of, of uh, Eaton and her family, how she inspires Cherokee scholars today, like her own great-great-great-niece, uh, Patricia Daw Dawson, who is a Cherokee historian looking in other areas of Cherokee history. Um, so Callie went on from that moment of graduating from the seminary later to return to the um, return to the seminary as an assistant principal herself, gaining that experience as an educator. But she would go on to receive a PhD in history at the University of Chicago before women were granted the right to vote with uh, the passage of the 19th Amendment, and she would become a uh, one of the first superintendents of schools in Rogers County, uh, a woman who became noted in the Oklahoma Hall of Fame before she died. She died in 1938, but was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1936. And what's very powerful is her work that would live on, such as her book, John Ross and the Cherokee Indians. And that's where um, she helps us to think about who, who tells our stories, why do historical narratives matter? Who are the heroes of the past and who decides that? And Callie was an individual who entered that dialogue, who left her mark on it by acknowledging heroes in, from her perspective as a Cherokee woman like John Ross when others would not, when the other meta narratives would sweep over that and, and forget it or marginalize it. That's how she was an advocate for these ideas of coexisting and multiple sovereignties and as a loyal countrywoman, um, bring these ideas to the world. And, and some of her work remains to be published, such as uh, the history of Cherokee Indians and her family um, continues to push for remembering her and the Cherokee Nation and other incredible seminarians like her. So I'm excited to share this chapter with you and that's only a glimpse of it. There's so much more. And please let me know if you are interested in continuing these conversations about her. And there's so much more to explore and understand from um, the, 
the hundreds and even thousands of women who went to the seminary um, from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. Thank you. Wado. Hi, everybody. I'm Sinu Um So we're talking for my particular talk about the legendary uh, Kate Barnard. Um, reflecting on an extraordinary life and career, Kate Barnard reminisced, what a privilege for a woman to use her gift of finesse and strategy in the greatest game of life, reducing the load of toil from the back of labor and increasing human happiness on her pathway to eternity. Like many white women during the progressive era, Barnard considered herself duty bound to rescue those who had been marginalized by larger society. She was a social and political activist, serving in leadership roles for charitable organizations, and was the first woman ever elected to serve in public office in Oklahoma, 11 years before women were granted the right to vote. Yet because she refused to identify herself as a suffragist, historians have unfairly described her as either anti-suffragist or anti-equality. Indeed, in examining her life and political career, Barnard's own choices force historians to re-examine how to define women's political activism. She consciously defied political and social labels in order to, uh, in order to a broad range of causes from workers' rights to the rights of Indian orphans. In purposely choosing her own path of advocacy, Kate Barnard also demonstrated that political activism need not be confined to the acceptable, acceptable gendered categories of the time. Kate Barnard, from the moment she decided that she was going to be a career woman, always spent her time choosing her own path because that's who she was. She chose from a very early time period in her life to be a teacher. And when that didn't work out, as many teachers decide early on in their careers, she decided she was going to go to secretarial school. And after a few years of secretarial school, she worked for the Oklahoma Territorial Legislature, which, which, which would be a paradigm shifting moment for her because that would lead to an opportunity to go to the St. Louis World's Fair. In going to the St. Louis World's Fair, she served as the territorial hostess. In that opportunity, she saw the poverty of St. Louis, but she also met with social scientists who talked to her about the wide ranging problems of poverty, how deep it could go, how problematic it could be, but also of all the possible solutions that there could be for poverty, for discrimination, for marginalization, and she thought, this is where I could do my best work. It was in that moment that she found her calling. And so upon her return, she began her charity career. Now, we would describe it at the time as charity, but what really starts to happen for her is an opportunity to begin her career as almost social justice. She reaches out to her connections through newspapers and other forms of media to connect to women and men as Christians and say to them, you have to reach out to your fellow human beings and help them in their times of need. And she, like other progressive women, uh, see their opportunity not just to be aware of the society around them, but to help those people. But this is the opportunity where she sees her chance to be different from other progressive women. She decides that she's not going to take no for an answer. She is not easily intimidated. She is not easily rejected. And she certainly doesn't take intimidation from men as any kind of threat either. And that's what sets her apart from literally everybody else 
particularly in Oklahoma politics. And this is where things change for her. Because of her activism, what starts to happen for Kate Barnard are opportunities that allow her to come into places like the State Constitutional Convention. And because of her presence there, Oklahoma suffragists believe that she would be the key to the suffrage movement. She would be the key to political equality for women. But Barnard realizes that for her, suffrage isn't necessary. She was able to make waves and create paths without the right to vote. She didn't need it. She was able to do what she wanted to do just because she was who she was. She wasn't anti-suffrage, she was a-suffrage. Now, the one time she speaks out on behalf of suffrage was on a trip to New York. She spoke out to the women of New York and said, I get it. I finally see why we have to have suffrage. It's because New York is so messed up that you have to campaign for the right to vote. In Oklahoma, I can do what I want because the men make a path for me to get it done. But in New York, you need the right to vote. I am therefore officially a suffragist. But that was in New York. In Oklahoma, she just got the job done. Thank you. Mm -hmm.